of the announcements that we do have. If you'll take that piece there. Yeah, thank you. And um, this morning also, um, Maddie Frank um, is going to share with us uh, from Dauphin Bible Camp, and we look forward to hearing about that as well, too. And I'd just like to put a note at the bottom there. Um, thank you to my church family. Thank you so much for being a part of making my milestone birthday such a memorable day. Just the phone calls, cards, and the gifts, the prayers, and well wishes, my heartfelt thanks, and that comes from Carol. All right. And then Carmen Barton and Lorena Wall and Maggie and Maben, Maggie Maben and Linda Jerome, they also have each have sent a thank you. And uh, just for their different cards that they've received and the gifts that have been given to them on behalf of the church family during their times of, um, yeah, just uh, some surgeries and different things that took on in their life as well, too. And thank you to Gilbert and Alice and Stephen and Murray for the well-kept lawns in spite of all this being so dry. And uh, the flower beds, they're doing the best that they can. And those roses at the West End, they're just beautiful and go take a look if you'd like to as well. Then I'd also just like to turn over the page and, and from the librarian. And uh, there's uh, some books there that Ken and Sue have brought to us as well and donated. And uh, there are a series of books by D.M. Myers. And that help us to understand some of the causes and also how the gospel is making a difference to our First Nations peoples as well. And uh, go ahead and, and pick them up as well, too. They're available to you. And then our missionaries continue to pray for them as they serve on the front lines out there as well, too. That's Bill and Janice Dick in Bolivia and John Castles with Human Trafficking in uh, Keswick, Ontario, and then Kim and Catley uh, Hutton in Bolivia, and John and Marissa Lowen um, in Ontario as well, too. And so there's a prayer line as well that you can, that you can read those um, uh, prayers there as well, and continue to pray for each and every one that, uh, from the church family that is needing a special touch from you as well, too, and we, we just bring them before you. And, and before Maddie comes, and I'll just ask her to make her way out here ready, and um, we'll just have a time of prayer, and, and we'll just um, ask God's blessing upon her as well as um, others as well, too. Let's pray. God and Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you, Lord, that you are great and awesome God, and we pray, Heavenly Father, as we look at these people that have sent little notes back to the church, and as we've upheld them previously during their time of illness and things, we thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can just uphold them and that we can pray for them. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we will not take an illness to pray for one another, but, Lord, that we will pray for one another even when times are good. And so, Heavenly Father, help us, Lord, to be a blessing. Help us, Lord, to be an encouragement to one another. And we give you thanks, Heavenly Father, for what you'll do. Once again, we pray, Lord, for those camping, camp workers that are working there and serving you this summer. We ask, Lord, as they reach out to the hearts and lives of the boys and girls, that they will not see a camp, uh, camp worker, or a, 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 but rather that they'll see you, that they'll see the presence of Christ. And so, Lord, we give you thanks for each worker that's out there. Bless them and guide them. This we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Maddie, would you please come? Do you want to hold this or you want to? I'll hold it. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> thanks. Can I use your Bible to stick my, my mask under? What's that? I'll just hold it. Sure. Nice. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Is this on? Can everyone hear me? Perfect. Well, my name is Maddie. As you all know, it's so nice to be here. I brought this guy with me today. His name is Andrew, and he's the director at camp. So we're going to split up the talking. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes, and then he's going to come up after me. So it's so nice to be back. I feel like I haven't been here. I mean, I haven't been here in years. I mean, like a year, two years. Anyways, it's really nice to be back. Uh, thanks, Mike, for inviting me out today. It was very nice of you. And I'm going to talk for a few minutes about what camp in general and about what Dolphin Bible Camp specifically um, has taught me over the years, what it means to me, and all the ways that it's grown me. So this summer, I'm the program director at Dolphin Bible Camp. This is my second summer of doing the job, but 
I did it last year as well. I was alone. I was with somebody else last year, but it's my first summer of doing it alone. Um, so I would without a doubt say that DBC, Dolphin Bible Camp, is the tool that the Lord has used the most to grow me in my life. My first summer at camp, as lots of you probably know, was when I was six years old. I was a young camper, and I think it's so funny for me to think back to myself as a small child then, coming to camp and being absolutely terrified by everybody. I was a very shy child, um, so I was very anxious every time I went, but I've been thinking a lot lately about what that small girl would have said had someone told her all those years ago that one day she would grow up to be the program director at camp and six-year-old me probably would have cried if I'm being honest but I kept going back every year and each summer I loved it more and more during the summer of 2014 as some of you guys also probably know I took what was then called the cabin leader training program CLT it's now the disciples and training program little plug send your kids um, so ever since 2014 I've been working as a summer missionary every summer because I grew up in a Christian home here in Nipua I can't remember a time that I didn't call myself a Christian, uh, but I do remember when it first was that I took my relationship with Jesus and I made it go deeper, and that was actually because of the CLT program at camp. So camp has taught me a lot of things. God has used it to teach me a lot of things. Um, but along with growing a deeper relationship and a more intimate relationship with Jesus, uh, camp has grown me a lot in my leadership abilities. So again, if somebody would have told that six-year-old girl back then, or even 14-year-old Maddie who did CLT, or even the 19-year-old Maddie two years ago, that I would have been standing in front of her home church talking about all of her life experiences, I probably would have cried again. Out of I have a very big pure fear of public speaking, so this is, this is a good time. Um, but God has had an astounding track record of taking the things in my life that once scared me and redeeming them and turning them into really beautiful things in the ways that I connect with him the most. He's been so faithful in the past and still now at pouring all of his strength over me. And I think back to my days of cabin leading, pouring out all the energy over me that he had, because we all know there's no way I could have been energetic all those years on my own strength. It's always been him. And I think that the biggest thing that camp has taught me, and it's taught me a lot, is that the Lord is my provider. Um, apart from Jesus, I can't do anything. I don't need anything else apart from him, but I shouldn't even desire anything else because I know that nothing apart from him is good. He is the sole reason why I've been able to work at camp as long as I have, and I give all of the credit of everything I've ever accomplished there to him. I recognized this the most last summer when we were stepping into so many uncertainties with COVID. I remember something that Andrew, who again, you'll all meet in a few minutes here, um, something he had said in the spring of 2020. All of us staff, we, we were doing a fellowship time every week. I think it was once a week, twice a week, um, so that we could see each other before we came up to camp. And we hadn't seen each other in months because of COVID. And so it was always good. Um, but I remember something he told us when we were having a Zoom call. He was talking about how we were all feeling a little fearful and anxious and worried about what the summer would hold with the ever-changing COVID restrictions. Um, and what that would mean for us as a camp and if we would be able to even run or not. But I remember that he said he didn't just hope that God was going to do amazing things through our camp, but he expected God to. And that really changed my perspective because once I started to expect God to do miraculous things, I noticed that he did. And that's not to say that he hadn't been working in prior summers. That's just to say I never expected it necessarily. And so I never noticed it nearly as much because I wasn't looking for all of those ways. And there were so many times last summer that God answered big prayers of mine and he answered them immediately. Um, just a brief story, there was one day I remember where I was praying with one of our female cabin leaders. Um, she's a very good friend of mine and she was just sharing about some of her fears that she was having about her life and about camp. Um, but so I was praying with her, I was praying for peace and confidence for her, and then after we had left to go back to our cabins that night, I just prayed over her again, and I was praying for vulnerability for her because I knew that there was more that she wasn't sharing, um, and it was just hard to walk alongside her properly if I didn't if she wasn't being as vulnerable with me. And so I just prayed that. I prayed boldly over her that night. And I remember the very next day, the very next day God answered those prayers. Um, and our friendship was just able to grow a lot deeper and sweeter because of that, because of that prayer. And so that was a very cool, a cool God moment for me last summer. This summer, I can't wait to start off once again by expecting God to show up and do those amazing things. Um, just a little bit about what we've been up to already this summer. The summer has just begun. We've had one successful week of camp already. Um, this past week, we were so blessed to be able to welcome four Wranglers in Training to the Wranglers in Training program, WIT is what it's called, and another 20 kids from Wednesday to Friday for our Young Campers program. Um, WIT, Wranglers in Training, is a cool program that was just implemented last summer of 2020. It's a huge part, the horse program, of what we do at DBC. Um, it's a big ministry for us, and it's how we reach a lot of our kids and teenagers. Um, and so it's so cool to have those teens join us so that they can grow their leadership skills and they can one day come work at camp with us. Um, and our Young Campers is the camp that I was far more involved in. Um, 
Um, and it was so fun to hang out with them for three days. They are six to eight, and yes, they are absolutely as cute as that sounds. Um, I had the best time over the last week singing and dancing and killing zombies with all of them. It was a very good time. Young Campers is definitely one of my favorite weeks of the summer. We have two of those throughout the summer. Um, and I love it so much because it always teaches me what Jesus really meant when he said to have faith like a child. We have so much to learn from our children, and so that's one of the main reasons why I really love working at camp. So once again, I, I'm fully aware that I can't do anything at camp without God, without his spirit in me, and without his strength. I'm constantly humbled at the fact that he entrusts me to be one of the bearers of his good news. It's an amazing, humbling, and a little bit of a terrifying thing that he allows me to teach other people about him and about what he's doing in my life and about my relationship with him. I'm so excited for another summer of doing that. And before I pass over the rain sand you're here, I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for all of your support of me over camp over all of these years, not just this summer, but the summer especially as well. Um, I know that I wouldn't be able to work at camp as long as I have if it wasn't for all of you guys. And I just appreciate you all. I always have. And I still count you as my family, even though I don't attend here regularly anymore because we moved a couple years ago. But yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for all of your support. So I'm going to pass over the mic to Mr. Sevigny. Oh, <laughs> well, God showed up this morning already. Uh, my prayer was that Maddie would be able to speak without being scared or anything. She always tells me how she doesn't like public speaking, and I think she spoke very clearly, and uh, that's because God is good. And uh, so my name is Andrew, and I am the executive director at Dauphin Bible Camp. I grew up actually half an hour from here in Carberry. I know we might be rival towns, so don't throw tomatoes or anything at me. But I um, grew up in Carberry, Manitoba, and started full-time ministry at Dauphin Bible Camp in 2012, and I uh, am now the executive director. It has been an interesting year, as you can all imagine. Um, I went on sabbatical last fall, the craziest sabbatical you'll ever imagine. Um, don't do that, Vlad, in, in uh, a year of COVID, because it's not what you expect it to be. Uh, our assistant director resigned the next day after I got back. So it has been a crazy year, like I said, but God is good. He provided another assistant director. And let me tell you a little bit about last summer. Last summer, we had 181 kids join us for camp. We ran day camp and uh, it was good. We ran June, July, August last year. We had, I think it was 20 kids give their lives to Christ last summer. And uh, I think about what my, what my boss once told me. Just because the method changed, the message stays the same. And, and even though we're doing day camp, the message of the gospel stays the same. Kids' lives are being changed, and people are hearing the gospel, and that is so, so good. Uh, Maddie already mentioned about our Wranglers and Training program that we started last year, and... Uh, What's cool about that, I'm just going to have paper flying all over the place here, but what's cool about that is that most of those people that took our program last year are coming back to serve with us this summer, and that is good. Um, Maddie also talked about how our horse program is important at camp. Well, I'll tell you a little story. My wife runs our horse lessons, and we started that at the start of May this year. We began with a regular week of riding lessons. Then the restrictions came into place, and we moved to having three kids at a time. We ran that for two weeks, and then we had to end our lessons. But we had 82 kids signed up for our horse lessons this spring. Those 82 kids, out of those, probably half of them had never heard the gospel, had never been to Bible camp. They come to ride horses, and we get to share the gospel with them, and that is, that is so, so good. And these kids usually end up back at camp. So you can pray for those kids. Pray that when they come, they would be... Move, the Holy Spirit would just move in their lives and, and continue to work in them that they would come back to camp and hear fully hear the gospel message. Maddie also talked about what we're up to this summer. Well, this summer we can have well, at least as of today, who knows what tomorrow brings um, groups of 20 kids 
and we're running two camps at a time. We're running a horse camp. We're running a regular camp. They can't interact with each other. But like I said, just because the method changes doesn't mean the message changes. So I want I I don't want to talk too long, and uh, but I want to thank you. I know that a lot of you pray for Dauphin Bible Camp. I know that a lot of you uh, give to Dauphin Bible Camp. And it's, it's those prayers and that giving that continues to help us run. There are camps across Canada that had to close their doors in this last year. Close their gates permanently. But God has been faithful. And our, our donors have been faithful. And people have been faithfully going to their knees to pray. So that's what I ask you today to do. Continue to pray for us. Pray that we would be able to clearly present the gospel. Because I expect kids' lives to be changed this summer. I expect my life to be changed this summer. Because God is good. Thank you. Open for his text, the scripture reading from First Corinthians or Ephesians chapter five, verse fifteen to twenty-one. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs, the Spirit uh, from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So far the reading of God's word. And Pastor Vlad, would you come and share your word with us, please? Thank you so much, Pastor Harry and Bernice and uh, the Dauphin Bible Camp uh, staff. Welcome again. So I'm having this morning only, I don't know, 12 or 13 pages of sermon notes. No, 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 no. And I know that it's uh, 30 above right now. And thank you for your patience and thank you for your faithfulness. Well, the title of this passage sounds like this. Let the Lord God of the Bible have no rivals in your home. In our text, uh, you have just have heard it, can be found in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. Let the Lord God of the Bible have no rivals in your home. As far as uh, I hope you remember that for eight Sundays in a row, we studied, we had been studying the life and the ministry of prophet Elijah. But to be more exact, what God was able to accomplish through the life of ministry of his faithful servant, Elijah. And we studied the danger, the menace of idolatry in the hearts of men, and how idolatry can impact the community, the nation, and people just living around us. So, as, uh, let me start first with an in introduction. I hope it's not going to be long, but uh, challenging and thought-provoking enough. Let me start this message with some introduction to the theme of this text in uh, Ephesians chapter 5. First of all, I would like to ask the fathers and the husbands. I hope we have husbands and fathers here present in this drive-in service. A question sounds like this. Do you know where your wife and children are spiritually at right now? Do you know the spiritual condition of your wife and your kids right now? What is easier for you men to make money at work or raise a child for God's glory in the fear of the Lord? Which is easier? Think about this uh, question. Are your children biblically literate? Are your sons and daughters fully aware of what the Bible teaches? How about your wife? According to researchers, and actually it's an old stat, stats from Southern Baptist Convention, between 70 and 88 percent of Christian teens, Christian teens are those kids who grew up in Christian homes, 
those children or teens are leaving the church by second year in college by second year in college, up to almost 90% of those teenagers and young men and women who grow up in Christian homes, they leave either the faith or they leave the church, but something happens. Nowadays, in 2021, the stats would be even worse. The problem is that most of those young people, by their own admission, they confess, in fact, many of those, that they're not serious true believers in Christ. There's a verse in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. 1 John 2, 19 says, They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they, are all, that they all are not of us. As you are fully aware, there are two sides in life, in this life, in this world. One is personal. When you are at home with your spouse and children, the other one is professional, when you are at work. Now let me ask you this directly. Which side of your life is more important for you in your short life in this world? The personal one? or the public one, the professional one? Which is more important for you? According to the Bible, which is the word of living God, the most important side of your life is the one where you, we, I, bear the most cherished titles, husbands, wives, fathers, or mothers. That's the most important title we can have in this life. As parents, we have a strong biblical obligation to train our children before they leave home. However, as Christian parents, we often make uh, three major mistakes. And you can find probably some more ones if you're honest, if you're frank enough before the Lord God. For instance, mistake number one, a very common one, and I've been in this boat, and I made that mistake, making the grade, which means being an excellent student. We want our kids to get a good education, and it's the first common gray mistake many Christian parents have made. But what is our primary goal of our children, if we ask this ultimate question? It is their faith. It is their walk with the Lord or before the Lord. The eternal destiny of our children is much more important than good education. The world around us preaches this doctrine. Get out of school, graduate from a good college, get a good job so, they can, so that you can make more money than mom and dad. No, there's more to life than making the great by worshiping the idol of academics. The second major mistake many Christian parents have been making or have made is making their teams or playing sports. If you teach your son or daughter how to slap the puck or make a wrist shot but fail to teach your children to keep their eyes on Jesus Christ, you have failed as parents. Playing on a team is a great achievement. However, no sports achievement will ever be as important as becoming a man or a woman of God. The idol of sports must die in our hearts if we want to spend eternity in heaven and not in hell. Now, there is the third mistake, the hardest one, making time with your spouse and children. Please don't get me wrong, my dear ones. Playing on a team and making high grades are all fine in the proper context, in moderation. The problem is when we have, when they have replaced the more important thing, faith in God of the Bible and the eternal destiny of your child's soul. We live in a, in a very anti-marriage culture, in a very anti-child culture nowadays. At the same time, the Word of God is clear about priorities in life. Proverbs 18.22 says, Proverbs 18.22, it's kind of interesting. For those of you who are not married yet, 
he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from God favor from God for the rest of your life hopefully Christians must recognize the sooner the better that the current rebellion against parenthood is an absolute revolt against God's design for marriage. The very idea that family is not as honorable as high income career is biblically wrong and I dare say it's even heretical. Family is a huge blessing from God. Children are a huge blessing from God. God opens and closes the womb we can and must receive children with joy the size of our families has become a matter of what convenience and income it is so common when many couples including Christian ones live according to this statement a boy for me and a girl for you praises be to God we're finally through we're all in the spiritual warfare for human souls between God and the devil. We must fight for our sons and daughters. Anything that causes us to compromise our beliefs can and eventually will become an idol. These gods try to convince us, Christian parents, that if we bow down and worship them, they will give our children what the God of the Bible cannot give, success, money, possessions, prestige by worldly standards. So how can we avoid worshiping idols in our homes, in a culture filled with them? There is an answer in God's word in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. We can and we should follow God's instructions through the Apostle Paul. So our text can be found in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. From this passage, we can learn that we must watch our walk, be good stewards of our time, understand God's will, yield to God's Holy Spirit, and order our relationship by the Bible. So point number one, be careful how you walk, verses 15 and 16. And I'm not talking about spiritual walk, like spiritual limping or something like that. Uh, physical walk, it's spiritual walk. Verses 15 and 16 says, therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. Be careful how you walk. I must say something here. We cannot expect our children to rise above our example. If our children, our own kids, do not see parents spending time in the Bible, praying to God, they probably won't do it either. If the children see and hear parents fighting and swearing, they will probably follow the pattern. Be careful how you walk, especially how you walk your talk. You can say one thing, but if you leave another thing, then it's called in the Bible hypocrisy. Be careful how you walk. Point number two, make the most of your time. I'm reading verse 16. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. And I'm not uh, discovering the new continent for you if I'm going to say this. Just look around after the service. Come back to your place. Look at the mirror and just compare your face, the image in that mirror with some of your old black and white photographs. How quickly has life, how quickly the life has just flown away, flown by. Time is precious and we only get how many chances to raise our kids? We only get one chance to raise our children for God's glory. They're young only once. And they are in our homes for a short while, for 16, 17, 18 years, and then they're gone. You look around, where's my son? Where's my daughter? Oh, they live somewhere far away. Our only hope is to make the most of the time we have we spend with our children. 
That means that as parents, we need to make some efforts to use the time wisely. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7, we read, Deuteronomy 6, 7, You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Unbelievable. It sounds like all the time. From sunrise to sunset, God, through Moses, makes it clear that teaching children the truth of God's word is an all-day, everyday process. We must teach our children at all times. Moreover, we're always to teach them what? The commandments of God, the truth of God's word. God has entrusted us as parents and commissioned us, not the youth minister or Sunday school teacher with this responsibility. Those people, yes, they have the responsibility as God's ministers, but your children are your children. You don't have to be a seminary trained theologian to read the Bible and talk about it to your kids, what the Bible means. How so? First of all, you can schedule the time with your children. There is a saying, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. You can have a family devotion once a day or twice a day. You know what just stunned my heart and my mindset recently? If you read uh, the testimonies, the faith journey stories from the past about the life, say, of some Puritans and other men and women of faith in the past, they had Bible family devotions twice a day. Many of those families, in the morning, at breakfast time, in the evening, before bedtime, or at supper, or dinner time, those people, they didn't have anything to do else in life. They just read the Bible with their kids. They just uh, spent time in God's Word, twice a day, every day. Can you imagine not having all those modern conveniences as we have nowadays, not having washing machines, dryers, uh, nothing like that, but they did it twice a day. They were crazy, but they were crazy for Christ's sake. Point number three, understand what the will of God is. Verse 17. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We believe in the sovereign God of the Bible, God creator, God wishes us the very spiritual best. God wants to spend time with us. Remember, He is our Heavenly Father. And we are allowed, in the Word of God, even to cry out to Him as Abba, Dad, Daddy. We can have close, intimate relationship with Him. He's our Father, and we are His children. However, there's an incredible pressure on school grads nowadays to achieve what? the American-Canadian dream at the expense of any costly Christian commitment. And praises be to God that we still have people, like people who are just visiting, attending our service this morning from Dauphin Lake Bible Camp. Those young guys and women, they just devoted their time, they committed their time to teach the younger generation the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have this tendency to forget that this world is not our home. The best this world has to offer is absolutely nothing in comparison with what God has in store for us. Whenever you have a time, today or tomorrow, probably today, read that verse, 1 Corinthians 2.9. 1 Corinthians 2.9, where God through Apostle Paul tells us. Okay, I'm not reading the verse for you. Something about the eyes and the ears, what we have not seen and heard. How about Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, where Apostle Paul reminds us that our citizenship is in our offices, is at work. No, our citizenship is where? Even beyond, above this roof, is in heaven. We need to understand that our children do not belong to us, ultimately speaking. They belong to God. Our attitude should be like this. I won't want, I don't want to tell God what to do with my children. I want the Lord God to tell me how I need to teach and edify them.
point number four, be filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit. Yield to God's Spirit is in whatever you do with your children. I can be your, it can be your meal time or any other time, any other activity. Often, especially when your family is in crisis or faces with some kind of a crisis. Actually, any crisis is a great opportunity to demonstrate true biblical faith. It is crisis that brings out the best and the worst of who and what we are as human beings. Moments of crisis reveal the nature and content of our faith. For example, have you noticed how this current COVID-19 crisis influenced your walk with the Lord, your relationship with other people, your relationship with brothers and sisters in Christ, your church, your family, everything in your life? How has it influenced you? Every crisis in our families should serve us as a call to family prayer, first of all, and most of all. Because a family without prayer is like a house without a roof. Point number five. And finally, order your relationship relationships by the Bible, by the Word of God. Verse 21. And actually, uh, verses 19, 20, and 21, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Verse 21, in particular, tells us what we are uh, that we are to subject to one another in the fear of Christ. How do you like that? To be subject to one another. The submission in verse 21 is demonstrated in three relationships in the following 11 verses of this, ch of this chapter. Wife to husband, that sounds scary. Child to parents, scary. And servant to master, oh, we're totally fine with that. In our work situation, at work we understand if uh, I'm employee, there's my employer, and my employee expects me to be, to be in submission, right? But why is it so different in families, uh, between parents and children, between husbands and wives? Submission in all three relationships in Ephesians chapter 5 is really essential. Just one illustration here. Can you imagine, my friends, an army, a military unit, where soldiers disrespect officers and generals. When uh, the soldiers are in the combat on the front line and an officer is given a clear order, private or sergeant, go run and do this. And that sergeant or that private would say, come on, you know, it's just uh, against my will, I don't care, I, I, I could not care less, and something like that. It would not be an army, it would be a total chaos. There must be a head in the home. Nowadays, we can hear this uh, statement, oh, there can be two heads, two heads. Interesting, interesting picture. And there must be obedience to that head. Oh. Submission never implies inferiority. The head of the family is never a tyrant. No. He is a loving leader, compassionate leader. The Lord Jesus Christ is such an example. He was submissive always to God the Father during his ministry. But in no way is he inferior to Heavenly Father. He is fully God. Today, you have heard, I hope so, in this message, that God should have no rivals in your home. And how can it be accomplished in your families? Let me repeat those statements one more time. Conclusion, number one, be careful how you walk. Two, make the most of your time. Use it wisely. Three, understand what the will of God is. And where is the will of God? In God's Word. Be filled with the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit. And five, order your relationship by the Bible, by the Word of God. Parents, 
Your job is to teach your children to behave like Christians and believe like Christians. During this camping season or your vacation time, please use your time with your children wisely, according to the Word of God. Have family devotions wherever you camp or travel. If you can attend a church service on Sunday where you camp, where you travel, it would be great to see and hear how other children of God worship the same Savior. Pray with your children, sing hymns and worship songs with them, and may the Lord God richly bless you and keep you in His grace. He is coming soon to take His bride home, His true bride. One quote from Charles Swindle, a famous American pastor, author of many good books. God's desire is that there, there can be a conscious, consistent transfer of God's truth from the older to the younger in the family. In Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 through 4, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. God's word to children is to obey their parents and honor their fathers and mothers. God's word to fathers is not to provoke their children to anger, but bringing them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I guess it's pretty clear in this passage. And Proverbs 22.6 says in the Old Testament, Proverbs 22.6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Remember, keep in your mind and your heart this verse. Whether you are the parent or not the parent yet, where you're on staff of Dauphin, Dauphin Lake Bible Camp, teach the children. Persevere humbly and prayfully, lovingly, compassionately. Pass on the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the hearts of those precious children. Let me pray before our final hymn. Yes, Father God, Thank you so much for reminding us uh, through your word about the importance, the significance of parenting. Lord, our time with our children is so short and is so precious. You just blink your eye and your child is 20. You blink twice and your child is 40. Lord, this time is so short and so precious. Bless our efforts. Bless our hearts and minds to apply your word in our lives. Bless every parent who is present today and the future parents bless them with strong Christian marriages that's what we ask and prayed for and all God's children can say amen still married to a young woman but unfortunately she is married to an old guy but that's okay uh, for benediction I'm reading from 2nd Corinthians chapter 13 verses 11 through 14 2nd Corinthians 13 11 through 14 finally brethren rejoice be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Today you can send an airy one. And all saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. May God bless you all and all God's children can honk. Amen. We are dismissed. <laughs>